Welcome to Words and Pictures Festival 2021. We are so excited to have you here. This is our fifth year doing Words and Pictures and our second doing it online. My name is Melanie McCree. I'm a senior library assistant at the Fort Vancouver Regional Library. I'm joined by Diane Clark from Vancouver Community Library, who will be helping us out today. Just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speakers. Please keep yourself muted while the authors are speaking. You can put questions in the chat and we will monitor them and ask them at the end. So, all right, we'll start with Ruby McConnell is a registered geologist and an outdoor adventurer who writes about nature, art and culture with a particular emphasis on the intersection of environment and human experience. A recipient of numerous honors, including the Literary Arts Oregon Literary Fellowship. She has written extensively about the Pacific Northwest and the environment and scientific and literary journals. McConnell is the author of two previous titles, A Girl's Guide to the Wild and A Woman's Guide to the Wild. She lives in Oregon with her husband, Paul. Welcome, Ruby. Tell us about yourself and what you're going to read. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope everyone else is having the kind of beautiful, spectacular fall day that we're having here. Um, in Eugene, it's a good day to celebrate the outdoors and the environment. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read uh, from Ground Truth, a geological survey of a life, dutifully holding up the cover, which is <laughs> beautiful and what all well-trained authors do. Um, it came out in the spring of uh, 2020 in April, sort of in the height of um, the pandemic shutdown. So it's um, nice to be able to read from it. And so I think um, what I'll do actually today is read briefly from Ground Truth um, and then um, a short piece from uh, the book that is my work in progress. Uh, so the piece that I'll read from Ground Truth is the first, it's not the first essay in Ground Truth, but it is um, the first essay that I wrote for the collection. Um, so it's special in my heart that way. Um, and then the piece that I'll read after that is actually um, one of the final um, portions of my work in progress. So at the counting window. For three months now, I've been thinking about the salmon. It started somehow in thinking about home or nesting or love or perhaps it was the receipt of bad news, an old friend long sick passing on, the anniversary of another friend's death. I had just returned from long travel. At first it was just the word salmon that came to mind, mostly in times of melancholy. Then it was images, the rush of water, silver green streaks of light infused with sadness and joy. Then memories, my mother with a camera urging me as a very small child to stand still as my father just home from fishing dangles a Chinook next to me for scale. In quiet times, I've begun to watch them jump upstream in my mind's eye, reaching over and over again. I have been under some stress. Now, in the solitude of winter, I revel in these moments with the salmon. I find the photo in an old album. In it, my father grins broadly next to us as I, as I, next to us as I carefully consider my cohort. I sit on the porch of my house in the trees, close my eyes, and let the salmon jump. I take deep breaths. For a moment, my mind shifts to the holidays, freshly over. I think I should have brought a cup of tea out with me, or some whiskey. I wonder how many eggs each salmon mother lays, if she will ever know how many children she has. I return to the stream. I eat a stale cookie and think about Christmas. The thought that my parents are getting old emerges. I'm tired. I must be getting old too. I think about a recent visit with a good friend who told me that we are all responsible for keeping ourselves above the water. I'm an Oregon native. Like the wild salmon of the Columbia River run, the streams of my youth come from a single source, descending first to the Willamette, then the Columbia, then out to the Pacific Ocean. Like all Oregon children, the story of the return of the wild salmon to their native headwaters year after year to spawn and die has been pressed upon me like the grooves of a well-worn album. How they return by scent to the river's mouth and begin the long and arduous climb to the river's, um, 
to, the, to their spawning grounds, the grounds of their parents and their parents before them, how there after spawning, they die and nourish the waters for the next generation. The stories describe the salmon as prodigal sons, overcoming all obstacles, debris, dams, fishing net, and sea lions. They tell of the salmon as Pacific gold, the lifeblood of the Northwest people and the keepers of traditions. In the best of these stories, the bravest of the warriors are the salmon of the Columbia River run, my run. These are the salmon that once ran so thick that fishermen could walk across cross their backs to make the river crossing. These are the salmon forever immortalized in pictures of native fishermen on wooden platforms, salmon jumping the falls over their head. These are the salmon that I see now behind closed eyes. How do they know what to do, I wonder? Why do they fight so hard? I drift to a memory of myself as a child grasping my father's hand in a darkened room while the salmon run past a picture window inside the Bonneville Dam. The room is oddly silent save for the clicking finger of the fish counter seated slumped on a stool next to the glass. At first disoriented, I'm not sure what we're watching, how such a window can exist inside the water. I wonder at what kind of place this is. The drive up the gorge had been long. The outside air was sharply cold and heavy with moisture. Somewhere on the highway, we had to slow for a bird of prey standing in the road. The dark green of the trees pushed against the white gray of low slung clouds. When we arrived, the dam stuck out in awkward contrast, a massive colorless slab of concrete. Inside, the weight of the dam itself and the energy from the powerful turbines has overheated the air. At the counting window, the salmons are in a thick frenzy against the glass, pushing forward in a mass of frantic energy. My stomach grumbles, and I wonder how long we will be at the window. My stomach did not know that it was irreverent to complain at such a time. At six, I did not know that some of those fish would have waited for more than a day at the base of the dam before entering the ladders. I did not know that some of them would travel nearly 900 miles and gain some 5,000 feet of elevation before reaching their destinations. I could not grasp the enormity of the struggle I witnessed at the counting window, the frequency with which they would lose the battle or the tenacity required to forge ahead. I did not know that I, unlike the fish, was on my way out, not back. I was only just making my way downstream and who knew how far adrift I might be cast. In school, we would learn about the salmon, so much so that the salmon would become the connecting thread between classes. We would learn about Lewis and Clark, their journey and deliverance to the land of trees and salmon, and about the native peoples who honored the salmon and other spirits. The salmon would be how we were taught about resources and our fragile interdependencies. At home, we were fed great thick cut steaks cut from the fat salmon our fathers carried home in worn red coolers. Everywhere else, the salmon populated public spaces and murals, sculpture, wallpaper, greeting cards, and coasters. In these images, the salmon are always shown swimming upstream, moving with power and purpose, often depicted not as creatures of the water at all, but as some kind of flying being. At six, I had not learned all these things, but I was old enough to know that salmon were important. For the moment, I kept still, quietly eyeing the scene behind the glass. A few weeks before the trip to the dam, I had received, in lieu of the more common gold cross or family rosary, a fishing rod for my first communion. I remember my father in response to the politely stunned silence that followed its unveiling, listing in all seriousness the levels of symbolism, coming of age, returning home, loaves and fishes, the symbol of fish as peace and abundance. Teach a man to fish, he said, as my mom handed me a small green tackle box with my name carefully spelled out across it in letters, stickers. And teach me to fish he did, in the coming years, I would spend long, lazy days along rivers and lakes, rod in hand, listening sometimes to my dad tell me stories from his childhood, more often sitting in relative silence, waiting for the line to tug, which it rarely did. 
The truth is, despite one's experience and previous good luck, salmon will earn their reputation as both resilient and elusive. A 12-year-old with a pint-sized rod proves to be a match for only the most unlucky. The salmon are fickle as well. I remember a day we sat for hours without so much as a bite, only to have a man arrive and catch three fish in 20 minutes, not a hundred feet downstream of us. Murphy's Law, Dad would say, shaking his head. Back in the belly of the dam, I leaned my face into the glass and watched while inches away a large sockeye fights his way upstream. I wrinkle my six-year-old nose at him. It looks like it requires an enormous amount of effort. He calmly stares back at me through the glass, his one unblinking eye, the only part of his body not moving. Temporarily losing the battle, he shoots backwards and out of sight for a moment, then pushing forward. I look up at my dad. He releases a deep breath and nods as if to acknowledge some kind of understanding with the fish. We pause a moment looking at one another. I turn back to the window. Silently, we watch the salmon swim. I've learned other salmon stories since that day in the dam. Stories about logging and dairies and sediment content. Stories about tribal lands and fishing rights and casinos. Modern stories in which we paint ourselves as both the downfall and salvation of the salmon. In these stories, the salmon are not wild, but of our own creation. One day I stop at a hatchery on my way out to the coast. I stand looking down through a metal grate at what must be thousands of small test tube salmon in concrete tubs. It is raining and hard to distinguish the hatchlings from the moving water. I think about the day at the counting window. They swim in a tight school full of youthful energy. I wonder if they know they are not wild. On my porch, looking at the trees, the story I want to tell myself is the one with the happy ending. I want to tell myself that I have arrived home safe and triumphant, having faced my obstacles and endured the uphill climb. I want to celebrate my survival to this point and begin to look back with fondness over my years. I want to know the danger is behind me. But I know that for the salmon, at least, the journey takes a lifetime and I am not yet old. Still, I think I am not so young that I do not have an understanding of my situation. I have just as much chance to make it past the counting window as anyone else. I close my eyes and watch the salmon jump upstream always. Mm. Wow, that brings back memories to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's sort of the uh, how it started essay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and then very much, much more briefly than that, um, here's a take from how it's going. From my work in progress, Wilderness and the American Spirit, uh, the quieting. In the before time, like now, humanity and all its engines roared in their forward press towards development, growth, and expansion. In the before time, the wheels turned and the levels levers pulled and the world strained at the weight of its own endless desire to build and consume and none of us ever thought it could be stopped. And then the pandemic came arriving as a whisper, blanketing the world with silence and slowing the turn of the wheel until even time stood still, days passing like water in a lazy stream. And for a while, we sat as stones in that water, allowing the wonder of it all to wash over us in a time we will recall to future generations as the quieting. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear, the president told the American people. During the quieting, we watched the tiny squares of township and range sections stretched neatly across the face of the country, slowly fill with red dots as the virus made its way inland. It stalled at first at the westerly edge, the far side of the Great Plains, and then was spurred far westward by the press of humanity from the east. Eventually, those dots grew and coalesced last overlapping each other and obscuring the effect of township and range so obvious in how we mapped our illness each dot centered like a bright red belly in the middle of the section the map reduced to hard political boundaries with national borders closed and different restrictions in each state township and range and those growing red dots 
40 million Americans lost their jobs in the first six months. Millions of businesses closed. In the quieting, the world changed. Streets emptied of cars, skies emptied of planes, the oceans emptied of noise, smog cleared, city lights dimmed, people changed. Without restaurants, they cooked. Without masks, they sewed. With nowhere to go, they walked. They checked on neighbors. Gardens appeared in front yards. Children rode bikes. On the streets, homeless people were allowed to retain their dignity, to claim a space in the world, to not be criminalized for their poverty or drug addiction or hard knock lives. Overhead for the first time in anyone who was alive's memory, the skies were absent of contrails. Corporations and governments changed too. They sent workers home, met customers at curbs, redirected funds towards communities, provided health care, barred evictions, reduced interest rates, extended debt relief. Fines were issues, quarantines imposed, curfews enforced, the world waited. For many, it was a time of fear and inaction, of grief and terror that played out not in the streets, but in their own living rooms. A disaster set across the, against the blue light of millions of screens. In those days, people took solace in geologic time in discussions of scale and risk and uncertainty, the kinds of things you learn from interacting with maps or studying earth science, the kinds of things geologists think about like extinction, catastrophe, collapse, and recovery. During the quieting, we learned that we are vulnerable. From the quieting, it was easy to see just how closely tied our fates are to the fate of our surroundings, how we reflect and amplify the human condition onto the world around us and how the state of nature when impaired impairs our own health. It was easy to see how we are all butterflies of a sort capable of causing hurricanes with a flutter of our wings. And it became easy to see that the old ways of being, the old systems and ways of thinking will not serve us in this place in history. Why? because in the past, our attempt at environmental rehabilitations and remediations and even conservation have reflected our continued attachment to our own dominion. Our belief in our separate and superior standing in the natural world and even amongst ourselves, it's something we have tremendous control over, Dr. Fauci told us. It is how we respond to that challenge that's going to determine what the ultimate endpoint is. In those early days, there was a sense of people keeping time of some kind of searching for meaning or purpose might take hold. Soon hundreds of thousands of Americans had died and we watched as police officers took the life from George Floyd's body in an agonizing eight minutes, like all the time in the quieting, seeming to stretch out in front of us forever. The protests raged for weeks. People lay in their street, their bodies prone on the summer sun, warmed asphalt of the bridges. And then with a swiftness, as summer came to a close, a bursting forth. People emerged convinced of immunity through privilege, faith, denial, or will. And the virus followed, changing, adapting, spreading, growing. In September, great winds blew and fires raged down forest valleys, bringing smoke so thick neighbors lost each other's houses even in the city. The air itself left. For weeks, people sheltered again inside, unable to breathe or move. This time, no one argued about wearing a mask. Each day rising and looking out the window to see if the winds had changed, if rain had come, but for what seemed like an eternity, the fires raged. It seemed like the election would never come. And when it did, the people sat and waited. First nearly for a week as the votes were tallied, then for weeks on end through lawsuits and recounts and jargon and denial. Meanwhile, Americans turned on one another, on democracy, on decency, until even our most respected halls were filled with rage and violence. Outside, the storms raged, fires burned, sister crises of the same evolving planet. Things began to fall apart, and all the while the virus went unchecked. The quieting did not return.
From the now time, it's easy to see what we lost. We had a chance in that time, an opportunity to turn things another way, to grasp another future, and still it might not be too late. Perhaps it is possible to sit in the stream of time, to sit as stones and abide and endure and press into our future, seeking out that essential state of wonder that allowed us to see the truth in the first place. Simple wonder, the wide-eyed fullness that arrives with newfound possibilities, a potent tonic for the spirit, the gift of the quieting. Because what we learn from the quieting is what is possible from humanity, the lengths to which we can go, the sacrifices we can make for our own sakes and the sakes of others. What we learn from the quieting is that the engines of commerce, busyness, consumption, oppression, waste, pollution, expansion, they can be turned off. In that time as a human collective, we almost succeeded and then we just let it slip away. And for what? A haircut, a Sunday brunch, a weekend at the beach, a beer with friends, profit, power, pride, no reason good enough. We know what we are capable of doing. We have felt the cool water run across our backs and we can return there anytime. Wonderful. Can I ask what happens later without spoilers? What <laughs> sort of things you're gonna cover? <laughs> um, yes, and I, I um, talk about how we might do that mm -hmm. and what tangible um, steps that we can take to step into a more sustainable future. Yeah. How would you approach research for this one? Uh, this, uh, this book is um, rooted on the Applegate Trail, um, the southern route of the Oregon Trail. And so I... Um, like with all of my writing, started with a lot of field work and a lot of place-based investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and went from there. And it is, it's a storytelling narrative um, that charts the American relationship to the natural world and how we got here. Excellent. We'll probably have more questions for you after this is over, but those were burning in me. So I thought I got <laughs> <laughs> right. So Stephanie, you're up. Uh, Stephanie Feldstein, Feldstein or Feldstein? Feldstein. Feldstein is the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, where she heads a national program that addresses the connection between human population growth, overconsumption, and the wildlife extinction crisis. She created the innovative Take Extinction Off Your Plate campaign, and her work has been featured in the Huffington Post, NPR, Salon, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and more. When she's not advocating for animals in the environment, she can usually be found writing young adult middle grade fiction in the company of her rescued dogs and cats named after literary figures. Give me an example, what's one of the names? Um, I have a Moby and a nice. Hermione <laughs> and a Gatsby. Those are my three dogs right Excellent. now. <laughs> and then I have uh, Roland the cat named after uh, for the Dark Tower for Stephen Oh, sure. Series. And, um, and another cat named Edgar after Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, who else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. All right, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and about the, uh, what you're gonna read for us. Yeah, so I'll talk to you a little bit about um, my book if you could see it in there. I know it's a white cover. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote The Animal Lover's Guide to Changing the World. And it's a, the reason that I wrote this book is because I've been an animal lover my whole life. And, but I had no idea really what I could do to help these animals that I loved so much, or even really what my own impact was on all the animals in the world around me, as well as those who I would never see. And, you know, so I really wanted to learn more about what I could do when I was much younger. And then as I learned more and my career itself really became all about, um, you know, animal advocacy and animal protection, I started to learn that there was so much that we could do. Um, prior to working at the Center for Biological Diversity, I worked at change.org, where my job was to help people set up and run and win campaigns about things that they cared about. And I worked on a whole range of issues affecting animals and the environment. And I learned that people are so passionate and loved animals and loved nature just as much as I did, but just didn't really know where to start and how to make a difference. 
And so this book is sort of it, you know, collective knowledge from a lot of that work that I've been doing as a campaigner and then now in my job at the Center for Biological Diversity. And also, you know, sort of a gift to my 16 year old self who would have loved to have a book like this um, when I was growing up. So I'm going to read uh, the, from the introduction, which kind of outlines um, kind of what to expect in the book and sort of what all the values are behind the book. And then I'll read a few little snippets from later on in the book to talk about kind of how it's, um, how it's set up. So the introduction. It can be a struggle to get out of bed in the morning, literally. On the most difficult days, I'm pinned in place by the dogs and cats who let me live in this house with them, stiff from sleeping in awkward positions so they could slumber undisturbed. On the best days, there's nothing cozier than snuggling with an adorable warm bundle of fur and devotion. Eventually, I do get up. These bundles have to eat. Once they're taken care of, I scrounge together my own breakfast and start scrolling social media where my feeds are full of animal news, animal photos, animal videos, animal gifts, and petitions to save animals. My morning routine might sound familiar. After all, this is a book for animal lovers, so it's a safe guess that a number of readers share their homes with animals too. Perhaps you don't have any four-legged bed hogs in your family, but you're not entirely comfortable with the idea of eating animals, or you worry about wildlife being evicted from their homes and not having anywhere safe to sleep at all. Maybe your love of animals started with your childhood dog or the neighborhood cat who adopted you as an adult. Maybe, not so deep down, you're still that little kid who dreams of horses or who could watch an anthill for hours. Or maybe you haven't really given it much thought but the video of a wombat riding a tortoise crossed your feed on a day when that was exactly what you needed. And you're just happy that we live in a world with wombats and tortoises so videos like that can exist. I've loved animals as long as I can remember, even longer from what I've been told. I still remember when I figured out where the fur and fur coats came from and refused to let anyone in my family leave the house with anything, wearing anything too hairy. I was five years old and protested the hall closet until the suspect coats were banished. I remember when I picked up a book about how farmed animals were treated and understood for the first time how much animals suffered to put food on my plate. I was 16 years old and stopped eating meat, much to the chagrin of my parents, my friends' parents, servers in restaurants, and anyone else faced with helping me figure out what I could make into a meal. Veggie burgers weren't as easy to find back then. As I learned what animals went through for our food, clothes, comfort, and entertainment, I realized there was a lot I could do even as a kid, to make the world a better place for them. And that mattered because their existence made the world a better place for me too. The more I learned about animals as I grew up, the more I adored them. That's still true today. Also true, the more I learn about the ways animals are in trouble, the more I want to protect them. I know I'm not alone in this. If you've ever shared the latest kitten video, tried to convince your friends to choose beans over beef, attended a protest, or even just looked at your dog and wondered what you could do to make her life happier and safer, this guide is for you. Animal lovers come in all shapes, sizes, and personalities. You may worship your dog, but you can't imagine life without bacon. Or you may feel compelled to speak out, but not if it means fake blood or naked protests. That's okay. Humans are constantly interacting with animals, whether we're aware of it or not. From the 80 million or so households with companion animals, to the wildlife who live outside our doorsteps, to the, de the decisions we make every time we sit down to eat. There's no shortage of ways to help them and they need us to help in any way we can. There's no us versus them. All kids have that moment in life when they learn for the first time that humans are mammals, just like their Labrador retriever or guinea pig or their favorite stuffed lion. For many kids, this bit of knowledge is mind blowing because by the time we learn this, we've been functional humans for a while getting food at the grocery store, using electronics, and putting our shoes on the right feet before we tie them. Human society has come a long way in severing our connection with other animals, and that's a huge problem. Not only do animals make our lives richer in countless ways, but the way we treat animals and the environment that animals, including humans, rely on comes back to bite us. I don't mean karmic retribution, though I wouldn't discount the possibility. I mean that our actions boomerang at us in very direct ways. When we pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, polar bears aren't the only ones seeing their homes and food disappear. Climate change has already forced human communities to move and is changing the face of agriculture. When we destroy habitat, we destroy the natural systems that filter water, create oxygen, provide food, 
and give us medicines derived from plants like quinine, morphine, codeine, and anti-cancer drugs. When we subject animals to cruelty, we begin to accept being cruel to each other. Most importantly, we'd never wanna replace the happiness of someone we love with suffering. There's no question that animals experience both pain and pleasure. Maybe it's not exactly the way humans do, but different species naturally have different ways they prefer to live their lives. Rolling around on dead things isn't my cup of tea, but the joy it gives my dog is undeniable. <laughs> Other animals deserve to live their lives with as much pleasure and as little pain as we strive for in our own. There is one very significant way that we are different from other animals. We've caused more devastation to the planet and other species, wild and domestic, than any other animal in history. We're also more capable than most other species of helping other animals live happily ever after. Whether it's stopping animal abuse or simply getting out of the way. We created this mess and it's up to us to clean it up for their sake and ours. The myth of perfection. When it comes to helping animals, there are a few sayings as apt as this one. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Every animal friendly step you take is a step towards saving lives. So put away that halo shining kit and get out your work gloves. Because when you spend time beating yourself up for every imperfection or worse, criticizing others for not doing enough, that's time that could have been spent helping people newer to the cause get more involved or making your voice heard to protect animals. Expecting perfection from yourself is a recipe for failure and expecting it from others is far more likely to alienate than inspire. After all, we're only human. An even bigger barrier to perfection than our flawed humanity is that we're all entrenched in a system that's designed to use and abuse other species. Even when we know better, it's nearly impossible to function in society without causing any distress to an animal somewhere along the way. Even if you don't eat animal products, you're probably cooking your veggies in a house powered by fossil fuels. Even if you have solar panels on your home, you're probably taking medication that was tested on animals. I could go on for pages about all the ways animal mistreatment is built into our society in virtually unavoided ways, unavoidable ways, thus making this the most depressing book you'll read this year. But that's not the point of this guide. There are all kinds of ways that you can buck the system by making changes in how you live your life and demanding changes to how things are run around here. And that's what you'll find here. The worst thing that can happen for animals is for us to stop paying attention or to give up trying to live a more compassionate life because we don't know where to start or the scale of animal suffering becomes too much. What you do matters and your actions are part of changing the system. Don't let every small setback distract you from the work that needs to be done to create a more animal friendly world. If you're feeling angry or disheartened or just generally having a rough day, play with your cat or take your dog for a walk. It'll make his day better and you can get back into action tomorrow. I'm changing the world one chapter at a time. There are three key ways that your everyday actions can change the world for animals. One, building momentum. Every day, you make choices that influence how animals are treated in the world. With each one, you get to decide whether you wanna be part of the movement that will change the system of cruelty or keep the status quo. Two, inspiring others. When you decide to live more compassionately, people notice. They notice your adorable, unique shelter dog. They notice that the vegetarian option at the banquet looks better than whatever they're eating. They notice that you're passionate enough and brave enough to speak up when you see cruelty and injustice. And noticing has a way of empowering people to follow your lead and be bolder about the things they care about too. And three, being the change. Your actions are powerful, not only in aligning your lifestyle with your values as an animal lover, but in leading by example. Nothing convinces people that change is possible like seeing someone who has already done it. What you choose to snack on during late night binge watching sessions or which shampoo you buy may not seem like revolutionary acts, but they're part of the countless decisions we make in the course of our day-to-day -day lives that affect animals. By becoming more conscientious about our choices, we can start making those decisions count toward a better world for them and us. And I will um, pause there and go into um, a little bit on the, the rest of the book. So from there, the book is divided into um, three main sections. The first one is get political. The second one is get wild, which is focused on kind of wildlife and our impact on, on nature and the animals we share the planet with. And the third one is get personal. And I really wanted to start it that way because as I write in the introduction, our individual actions really do matter, but we are part of this larger system. And so I wanted to you know, make sure that 
you know, with this book that there's an understanding of kind of how our choices are limited and defined by the world around us and also how we can change that. Um, so this book really, um, it's not just for people who are starting out, it can provide kind of deeper uh, tips on activism as well as kind of those, those individual lifestyle changes. And it's also an opportunity, um, you know, with the different sections covering, you know, companion animals and farmed animals and wildlife, it's an opportunity for people that if you've already been focused in advocacy around an issue that you particularly care, care about, that this is an opportunity for you to branch out and extend that circle of compassion to, um, to other species and, and other causes as well. So each chapter in the book starts off with a, a little blurb about a different species um, to help you know, kind of illustrate the point of that chapter and to help readers um, get to know some of the, the animals that share our world. So I'll read one of those from each section um, and go from there. So the first one to start off the chapter called Animal Advocacy 101. Octopuses have been documented snatching up coconut shells and hoarding them to use later on as shelter. If they manage to get a hold of two halves, they'll reassemble them into a closed hideaway. In captivity, they have a reputation for thwarting researchers and causing mischief. Otto the octopus in Germany's Sea Star Aquarium figured out how to, how to short circuit the aquarium's electrical system by shooting water at a spotlight over his tank. Others decide they've had enough of tank life, like Inky the octopus, who made his famous escape from New Zealand's National Aquarium by slipping out of his tank under the cover of night and squeezing through a pipe back to the ocean. It's hard to know exactly what these crafty cephalopods are thinking, but they seem to have a clear goal, the ability to envision a series of actions to achieve it and a lot of patience. We should all strive to be like octopuses. When we see a problem in the world around us, we need to create a plan and put that plan into action. So then that chapter goes on to talk about, you know, kind of how to get started with, um, you know, with identifying what it is that you care about and want to change and how to start taking action in that direction. Um, in the get wild section, it starts off with a chapter called green is the new black. Birds have been recycling long before the cool kids started. They use fur, lint, and hair when building their nests, and many are into interior design, adding colorful shells and berries, as well as bits of string, plastic, and other treasures found, and other found treasures to make their bachelor pads more attractive to the ladies. But our towers of trash have become way more than birds or any species can handle. It's time to go beyond curbside or nest side recycling and rethink how we consume things in the first place and how our choices may affect millions of wild animals we'll never meet. And in, in that chapter, it, um, it goes on to talk about how, you know, how every decision we make, every purchase that we make has an impact somewhere down the supply chain, even if, um, you know, even if we don't see what that impact is. And, um, and it really talks about the importance to really rethink our whole consumer culture and how we approach um, what it is that we, we buy and use. And then I'll read one more of these and then we can um, go into Q&A. So this is toward the end of the book. Um, in the last section of the book, in addition to addressing, you know, kind of personal actions that people can take and, um, and different actions to take around companion animals and the, you know, and the different types of products that we use, I also talk about, um, you know, things like avoiding burnout and why it's so important to, um, to live according to your values. And so I'll leave with this last blurb from a chapter called Be the Change. Elephants take care of each other, and not just when everything is rosy for the herd. They'll surround vulnerable family members to keep them safe. They'll slow down if one is injured or sick. They'll try to lift each other up, sometimes literally if a herd member is ailing. Their mourning rituals are complex and well-documented, and they're known to weep in times of distress. They try to console one another, and they try to save one another. They've also been known to save other animals in trouble, such as a baby rhinoceros or a dog. Elephants live in a world rich with emotion and empathy, where they know their actions affect those around them. We should all be more like elephants. And that's really, you know, one of the other main themes of this book is that, um, that idea of compassion. And I think a lot of times as people who care about animals, you know, we're, we're often questioned, well, don't you care about people? And they're not separate issues. I mean, compassion is not a zero sum game and what we do to animals affects uh, what we do to people. And our lives are so intertwined that oftentimes, you know, the book talks quite a bit about how 
you know, addressing issues that affect animals also help address a lot of these, uh, a lot of social justice things that we see in our own society um, and vice versa. So the, you know, the movements are very much tied together. And, you know, and with that last bit, um, you know, talking about elephants and how they care so much for each other and care so much for other species is really reflected throughout the book, um, you know, and how this ties to, you know, to our lives and, and how we take care of each other and the world around us. You just happen to use as examples my two favorite animals. So <laughs> cheering. <laughs> so I, I have a question actually for both of you. And I I know that this might be something that's a little bit revolutionary to ask. So <laughs> but and this is using it in author speak, but target audience. Who's your target audience for this? You want to start, Ruby? As everybody. <laughs> um, no, my, tar my target audience is um, particularly, I, I think, uh, people who don't think that they're environmentalists and people who don't think that they have uh, a relationship to the land. I think all of my writing uh, is centered on trying to get people to figure out what that relationship is. Uh, so city folk, <laughs> and all those non-campers and, and, you know, people who spend a lot of time in digital space. I think that, that those are the people that I'm trying to target and bring over to my dark side with me. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Stephanie? And I realize the answer is also everybody. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there like must have I been said, somebody, some group you had in mind or groups. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I think that there are pieces in this book that can be useful even for more seasoned animal advocates. But for me, the person who I really had in mind for this was, um, you know, the, the audience of people who will share any animal video that comes their way, right? They're like, you know, half of their like Instagram people who they follow are actually dogs. Like, like mm -hmm. people who, you know, love animals and love the, the presence of animals and the joy that they bring to us, but haven't really thought about what their impact is on animals or what they can do um, to help make the world a better place for these animals that, that they love. Wonderful. I would, you know, I was listening to you and I thought the two of them have got to be hearing crossover from what they're working on. There have to be some things that you thought, oh yeah, I've been thinking about that or, or I looked into that. Is, was there some commonality there? This is just curiosity on my part. Totally yeah, different. I mean, stuff. I can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I, you know, I, I admire Ruby, your writing is beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and personally I relate to that a lot, but you know, I think especially in, um, you know, in the second, essay that Ruby read, you know, really thinking about kind of those, the, the systems of how we impact other animals and, and really thinking about like, well, what happens when we get out of the way? What happens when we, you know, change what we're doing and give them space to not just to recover, but to thrive. And I think that was one of the big ones that really stood out for me. Yeah. And I think maybe that's where I was going with that too, is that there was that thread there. So Ruby, deep subject your new book that's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I realized that the answer could here be everything, but was there a polarizing moment? Was there something that you said, yes, I have to write this book? Um, yes, actually, I, I had been doing, um, I had a winter of really deep um, reading and research, and I was, I was reading um, Sort of, sort of a lot of canon, environmental canon, um, and kind of had this moment where I thought, you know, I know a scientist, but in background, you know, and, and a uh, and a hard, I come from a hard science background, and, and I sort of put this book down and thought to myself, you know, the environmental crisis, as much as it is a a, a scientific crisis. It's also a crisis of the human spirit, mm -hmm. and you know, like this, like that's you know, when Stephanie talks about like compassion, mm -hmm. and about um, you know, in your individual feelings, and trying you know, needing to to trigger your compassion, and needing to be able to find a gateway to action, and that you can do that through um, animals and through pets and through like nurturing that. I think that that's like so potent and important. Um, be because it speaks to the human spirit mm -hmm. 
And I think that that when you're coming from that place of deep compassion is where uh, you you find the impetus for change. And I think if change is what you're looking for, then you have to tie it to something like that that's really mm -hmm. important. And that's the genius of uh, the of uh, you know the kind of work that Stephanie is doing, you know, mm -hmm. and and in getting people getting to people in that particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a cynical society at this point. There's been a lot that has hit us all at once. So it's good to have something that's sort of a, a call to arms, I guess you could describe it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the question to you also, Stephanie, was there a moment where you said, yes, I have to write this book. I'm, I'm going to stop waiting for the right moments. It's now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, part of it came um, aligned with a little bit of a career transition because when I you know, when I left change.org, part of what I wanted to do was to, um, part of the reason why I moved back to kind of the nonprofit space with the Center for Biological Diversity is that I really wanted to be able to dig in deeper to issues like as, as a campaigner and advocate myself, instead of kind of working a little bit on everything, mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to like dig in deeper on the, um, on the work that I was doing uh, for myself. But along with that, I realized that I was carrying all of this, um, all this knowledge and experience that could really help Mm -hmm. other people who, um, you know, who were just getting started or who just really wanted to figure out um, where they could go next with, you know, with their passion and, you know, with their activism. So, yeah. so yeah, it was that kind of moment in time. And, you know, the timing was interesting because I found out that my book sold um, literally the week that, um, that Donald Trump was elected. <laughs> and, so it was just this really interesting conversation where on yeah. the one hand, everyone was like, oh God, what do we do now? But then, you know, like my editor was really fired up and she was like, yes, but this is the kind of book we need now. Like people are mm -hmm. gonna need to know what to do and, you know, and where to take it from here. And so, you know, that also leads to a lot of like what I'm thinking about in terms of what kind of um, nonfiction project I wanna do next. Cause, you know- in, in That's to be my also, next like, question <laughs> was where do you go from but, here? Yeah, I think, you know, the next theme that I'm really like, you know, looking at and, and doing some writing on now is, um, you know, is the idea of hope, like a lot of what I hear now, like back, you know, in 2018, there was a lot of like, well, what can I do? And now there's a lot of questions of like, well, I mean, frankly, like, how do we go on? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we, um, you know, and people like climate anxiety is a real issue. Mm -hmm. And it's a deep, deep issue that a lot of people are, are struggling with. And the question that I get asked all the time is that like, where do you find hope? And, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you keep going with this, knowing that the odds are stacked against us, knowing that we are facing these really huge crises. And so that's something that I've been doing a lot of, um, you know, I, I do a lot of like speaking engagements and stuff for work. And I've been doing a lot of talking about that and, and thinking about that. So that's, that's the next project that I'm, that I'm playing around with. Um, yeah. Ruby, she said something important there. She has people who ask her, where do you get your hope? So I'm gonna put that question to you. Um, I get my hope from time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a geologist. We have a very long view. I get my hope from um, places like Mount St. Helens, mm -hmm. where they, they said it was gone and buried never to, be grown again into a forest and they were very wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get my hope from the sheer number of people who showed up in Eugene, Oregon in cold weather to vaccinate total strangers. Mm -hmm. I get my hope from the simplicity of people being willing to give each other space. I give, I get hope from, um, people having grace and patience with one another in trying times. I think that uh, incrementalism is a good response to catastrophe. And I think yeah. that it's worked for the planet for a really long time. <laughs> 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 and and that there's, there's hope in that. Excellent. I'm gonna, I'm checking the chat. It sounds like <laughs> I haven't seen any new questions that have come in. So I think maybe I wanna end with was there some message that people who are here that you wanted them to take away today? Was there something in particular of if they were, could remember nothing else, what's the message that you'd like them to remember? Ruby, let's start with you. Um, every choice you make matters. And uh, there's no reason to think that your actions can't 
um, create change. Mm -hmm. How about you, Stephanie? Um, well, that's right, obviously, along the <laughs> themes of what I talk about. But I guess another one that I'll leave people with is to never be embarrassed by how much you care about animals mm -hmm. and nature and how they're treated. I mean, these things are important and they matter and they bring so much beauty and intrinsic value to our world that they are absolutely worth the fight. Um, and, you know, and we need to keep fighting that fight, even when things look grim, there are so many opportunities for change and you're not alone. There are so mu many other people out there fighting alongside you. And there is a comment. I love these books. Thank you. With someone, so I thank you as well. This has been wonderful, lady. Thank, lady, thank for your contribution. It's been a long day. Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and I am hoping that everybody's going to come back at two fifteen. We've got an author reading from Lydia Valentine, and then we also have some stuff that the staff is going to read for y'all. So, thank you very much, ladies, for joining. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.